Hi, everyone. Randy Nessie here. I've spent my entire career trying to figure out ways to bring evolutionary biology to bear on the problems of medicine. So it's no surprise that the most common question I get is, what is evolutionary medicine? This 10 minute video is my attempt to answer that question as briefly as possible. In a nutshell, it's just using the basic science of evolutionary biology to make us better at treating patients and understanding disease but it's also trying to look at problems in medicine and how they can give evolutionary biologists new projects and new things to think about. Both directions are important. But it sounds like evolutionary medicine is something radical or something alternative or some new method of practice. Not so, it's just like genetic medicine or using physiology or anatomy. It's just bringing one more basic science to bear on the problems of medicine. Although unfortunately, evolutionary biology is just now being applied in systematic ways to understand disease. It's been coming a long time, even before Charles Darwin, William Paley in his book, Natural Theology, wrote beautifully about the contraptions in the human body uh, that just didn't seem to make too much sense. He was trying to reconcile things like the appendix and the path of the recurrent laryngeal nerve with a design by a deity. Darwin was so impressed by this, he said that it gave him as much delight as Euclid, and the careful study of these works was the only part of the academical course which was of the least use to me in the education of my mind. Darwin may even have stayed in the same lodgings that Paley used two generations earlier at Cambridge. You don't have to be a Darwinian uh, to think deeply about the nature of the body and why its structures are sometimes not working very well at all. Here's another Darwin in 1794, tries to unravel a theory of diseases by reducing the facts belonging to animal life and the classes, order, genre, and species, and comparing them to each other. And these are the real origins of the basic idea of natural selection with Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. That sentence is from the very opening paragraph of his very long poem, Zoonomia. But it was Charles Darwin uh, who really was the one who taught us um, that there we could see all life as deriving from a single source, that is phylogeny, and a second discovery, a different discovery, that natural selection helps to explain why traits are so well adapted for their purposes. These are the people who took those discoveries and applied them and developed them further. Uh, John Maynard Smith used game theory and he came from an economics background. Um, Bill Hamilton and Nico Tinbergen were immensely inspiring. George Williams is my collaborator and friend, deceased unfortunately now, who made all of this possible. And Ernst Meyer inspired all of us with a very simple idea. He pointed out that there are two kinds of explanation needed for everything in biology. One approximate explanation about the mechanism and how it works, and also an evolutionary explanation about how it got to be the way it is. The core insight that got a lot of work going in evolutionary medicine is recognizing that maladaptations need explanation just as much as adaptations. There's such incredible perfection in the body. At first, you don't think that there are any problems. If you look at the loop of Henle and how in the kidney it keeps our pH and salt and acid balance normal, and the heart and how everything keeps pumping, not just for 10 years or 20, but for decades and decades. The eye, not only with the only clear tissue in the body, but muscles that can squeeze and expand that lens so the focus is exactly on the retina and other muscles that swing the eyeball to and fro so we can look sideways and up and down. The hand is an equal miracle once you start getting into the exact location of each of those tendons and nerves and arteries and joints. The clotting system works very well, thank you, and it hit better, and it does. And finally, something I hated studying in medical school, but in fact now turns out to be very beautiful, is intermediary metabolism and biochemistry. Once you start taking an evolutionary view, all of those connections start making sense. 
then they come to the second half of medical school and going into the clinic and seeing disease. And it really makes you wonder if somebody just didn't get drunk and take the second half of the work off. Um, the wisdom teeth, really, do we need those? And if you fall skateboarding, you're gonna break that bone right there. It's called a collie's fracture. The appendix, do we really need it? Astronauts get it taken out before they go out to space. The coronary arteries, couldn't they still be just a little bit wider? Please. The spine, it's not just your spine that hurts, it's everybody's spine that hurts. We're still adapting to a million years after our ancestors first began walking on two feet. And then there is the birth canal. It's so ridiculous to expose mothers and babies to such pain and risk when the baby could just pop out through the front of the abdomen. Why on earth didn't natural selection do a better job? So evolutionary medicine, again, is a field that uses the basic science of evolutionary biology to better understand, prevent, and treat disease. There are two parts to it, the same as the two discoveries that Darwin made. One is the unity of all life, uses phylogeny and phylogenomics to trace patterns, and the other is adaptation and maladaptation. The first is well established. Phylogenetic approaches are very well developed ever since the grand synthesis uh, between genetics and evolutionary biology in the middle of the 20th century. We use them to trace human ancestry, to trace pathogen origins, especially of things like COVID, and environmental influences on the human genome, such as what happens when humans move to cold climates or when they're exposed to a plague. And finally, there's the especially interesting evolutionary history of traits that make us vulnerable, comparative anatomy of the appendix, that kind of thing. But the other question is why bodies aren't ro more robust. This is a new area of inquiry, and we're just getting going and figuring out the best ways to frame and test hypotheses in this area. The core insight here is that traits that leave us vulnerable to disease need evolutionary explanations. It's a shift from a mechanics view of life, which is the um, standard for most medics. That is, most mechanics ask, how does it work? What's broken and how can we fix it? It's been of enormous benefit. Um, if I had to pick one half, this is the half I'd choose uh, to make use of in medicine, but it really is only half of the story. If you take an engineer's view, you ask a different question, not why this person got sick, but why the design in general has been left vulnerable to failure. Why wasn't it designed better? How did natural selection shape this disease? That's the question that beginners ask. It must be useful somehow. But it turns out this is really the beginner's mistake and the most serious common mistake among beginners. It's a bad question. Diseases do not have evolutionary explanations. They're not products of natural selection. The right question is, why has natural selection left the body and a particular trait in particular vulnerable to disease? That's a very good question. So the answer I was taught in medical school and many people still emphasize is that natural selection is just too weak to make things better. After all, mutations happen, genes can drift to fixation, uh, development isn't completely canalized, so hey, the body can't be perfect. That's absolutely true, and perhaps the single most important reason for vulnerability, but it's only one explanation. There are several others we need to consider. Here they are in a very quick list. I have a whole other lecture to elaborate this because this is right at the core of what's most interesting about evolutionary medicine to me. First one is that pathogens evolve faster than we do. No surprise that we still get infections. The second is we change our environments faster than we can adapt to them. So we love our fat, salt, and sugar and comfortable chairs, even though they kill us. There are natural selection, there are limits to what natural selection can do, as I just mentioned, such as mutations and the lack of our ability to have perfectly canalized development. But more interestingly, every single trade is a trade-off. And for instance, there's often the trade-off between performance versus robustness, and performance often wins, leaving us vulnerable. And another one that's related is that natural selection does not in fact maximize health. It maximizes reproduction. If there's a contest between the two, reproduction wins. 
And last but not least, a lot of things that we think of as diseases, such as pain, fever, nausea, cough, vomiting, and anxiety, those aren't diseases at all. Those are useful responses whose unpleasantness is part of their built-in usefulness. And distinguishing them from diseases is an important contribution of evolutionary medicine. Again, this is just the briefest summary of one way of categorizing these other things to look for. A whole other lecture is devoted to that topic. It's been 30 years since George Williams and I published a grandly titled paper, The Dawn of Darwinian Medicine, to call attention to this way of looking at things and these new questions. Actually, they're not new questions. Uh, they've been around for a long time. But what we did do is try to have people taking them seriously and posing specific hypotheses and testing them instead of just assuming that there was one simple answer. Lots of new papers coming. That's a, a older article, that graph uh, that Joe Alcock did showing the rapid growth of publications in the field. Now, these are some of the first books that got things going. Paul Ewald wrote a wonderful book about the evolution of infectious disease, uh, inspired in part by Adaptation and Natural Selection, the book by George Williams that set us straight about group selection. Um, the other books there are early ones in the field, including Why We Get Sick, my book with George. And it's been very satisfying to see that so many of these books are out in second editions and so many new books uh, continue to be published every year, many of them from the Oxford University Press, but from others from a few other places. And they're becoming specialized too. Um, here are two books, one on psychiatry and my recent one about evolutionary approaches to psychiatry and how it can make the field more sensible. Concluding, uh, we now have banded together as an international society for evolution, medicine, and public health. Uh, that society was formed really by Steve Stearns uh, to create the journal Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health, which he began editing and now I think seven or eight years ago. Um, has a high impact factor, published open access. Charles Nunn is the editor right now. Um, and is doing very well. The Edison Evolution Medicine Review is a newsletter, an online blog. Club of Med is a weekly journal club that anyone can tune into and join in very interesting discussions about evolution and medicine. EvMed Ed is an online database with over 1,600 online educational resources. If you find all this interesting, please join us. Uh, you can sign up and either join the society at EvMed org or sign up for the freeze newsletter and there's lots more of my thoughts on my own website at nessie.us thanks so very much <laughs>